For most people, hobbies provide an escape from daily life, offering joy and satisfaction through pursuits like gardening, photography, or painting. But for some, these simple pleasures don't quite cut it, and instead they turn to motorsports, a world of high speeds and often even higher price tags. The financial burden of maintaining their cars, covering travel, entry fees, teams, and much more can be overwhelming. And to sustain their passion, some racers have turned to desperate and dangerous measures, including drug smuggling. John Paul Sr., the Whittington brothers, and Randy Lanier all garnered incredible racing accolades, like breaking records at the Indy 500 and even winning at Le Mans. But they also made a copious amount of money through their shared ability to coordinate massive drug smuggling operations, utilizing giant barges with secret compartments and planes which could land on the back straight of their very own racetracks. Of course, this high-risk lifestyle caught up to all of them, culminating in dramatic arrests, a life sentence in prison, and for one, a manhunt which is still ongoing today. This is a story of velocity and vice, of pistons and pot, and of motorsports and murder. This is the story of the drug smuggling racers who risked everything. Johan Leendert Paul was born in the Netherlands in 1939, right before the start of World War II. He faced a rough childhood, collecting leftover cigarette butts to trade for scraps of food. At age 15, his family moved to the United States to pursue the American dream. Going by John Lee Paul, he excelled in math and business, but his temper kept getting him kicked out of school. At 20 years old, he got married and had his first of four kids while washing dishes at a hospital for 65 cents an hour, just barely scraping by. However, despite his personality flaws, Paul was brilliant and pulled himself together, graduating on the honor list from Ball State University. Around this time, he was also arrested for his first criminal offense, stealing toothpaste. Next, he got a scholarship to pursue his master's at Harvard before joining an investment firm where he managed a mutual fund that grew from $600 million to over $4 billion in just six years, thanks to the explosion of companies like KFC and Mattel, who even gave him a plaque that read, Without John Paul, Mattel would have never made it. Paul himself became a millionaire before the age of 30 and received a 64 Corvette as part of his signing bonus with the firm. He decided to try the car out at an autocross event and quickly caught the racing bug. Racing through SCCA, he became the Northeast Region Champion in 1968 and 69 behind the wheel of a Shelby 427 Cobra. Then he purchased racing driver Sam Posey's Dodge Challenger, which helped him collect even more wins. From the outside, it appeared that John had achieved the American dream he'd set out to accomplish, but the cracks were beginning to appear. His wife Joyce had been having an affair with another racing driver, and the couple split. John couldn't bear it, and left everything behind, quitting his job and selling all his possessions before buying a sailboat and disappearing. He sailed around the world for well over a year, apparently returning to the Netherlands, going through Europe, and eventually passing through Florida, where he learned that he could leverage his sailboat to make large amounts of money on his travels, picking up marijuana in the Caribbean and bringing it back to Florida. With a new source of income, Paul returned to racing and asked his oldest son, John Paul Jr., to join him, both on the racing team, but also with the smuggling operation. Jr. was well aware of the risks and his dad's raging temper, but ultimately chose to move to Florida, primarily to rekindle the relationship with his father, who had acquired a new, very appropriate nickname, the Old Pirate. Senior continued to improve and even managed to win the FIA World Challenge for Endurance Drivers, thanks to finishes like first in class at the prestigious 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1978, where he drove the Dick Barber Racing Porsche 935, along with Barber himself to finish fifth overall, only losing to the ridiculously fast prototype cars. At this same race, Paul also faced the Whittington brothers, who had acquired their seat in the race through similar methods. They were forced to retire with transmission issues, but their luck was about to get much better and John Paul Sr.'s was about to run out. Don and Bill Whittington were the oldest of racing driver Dick Whittington's three sons. Their dad had them compete against each other from the time they could walk, 
racing motorcycles, horses, boats, and airplanes before eventually getting into cars. They jumped right into the deep end and entered Le Mans in 1978 with very little experience compared to the rest of the field. They bought their car, a Porsche 935, from Yoast Racing, which has gone on to become the most successful team ever at Le Mans, with 15 wins under their belt so far. However, this year, with the failed gearbox, the brothers were forced to retire. But they weren't discouraged for long, and doubled down on their racing careers, even buying Road Atlanta to get some more practice and to burn some cash. The track was known for its extremely long back straight, which some say was a key selling point to the brothers, as it allowed them to land their planes, unload smuggled drugs, and then take off again without any interference. Through methods like this, the brothers made tens of millions, so when it was time for Le Mans again the following year, they decided to just pay for a seat to race in one of Kramer's K3 Porsche 935s. Kramer Racing was also owned by two brothers, Manfred and Erwin, who worked to develop the fastest 935 around, thanks to a lightweight, aerodynamic Kevlar body, air-to-air -air intercooler, and other tricks. The third driver was Klaus Ludwig, an incredibly skilled professional who would go on to win at Le Mans multiple times. He was considerably quicker than Donner Bill, so he set the qualifying time, and was slated to start the race, to showcase just how fast the K3 was. However, the Whittington brothers were against this plan, as they wanted to drive first, arguing that if the car broke down or had an accident, their money would have been wasted. Manfred reminded them that it wasn't their car, so they didn't make the decisions. But what if it was? Don asked how much to buy it, and in an attempt to discourage the Whittingtons from arguing more, Manfred gave Don a number far greater than what they were selling for at the time. However, the Whittington brothers happened to have more than enough cash on hand, and in the end, it took less time for the negotiations than it did for Manfred's wife to count the cash. Bill would start the race. He would be starting in third, behind the two Porsche 936 prototype cars. In their class, they would be competing against the actor Paul Newman, who arrived in a Hawaiian Tropic suntan lotion liveried car. The Whittington brothers also appeared to have sponsors, but unlike Newman's, these weren't real, and the brothers had paid some models to walk around spraying rebottled perfume hoping to cover up where the money was really coming from. They would later work with the suntan lotion company too, Sun System, but this turned out to be a front for a drug smuggling operation as well, which had grossed over $300 million before being exposed by the DEA during Operation Sunburn. Luckily for Bill, the race would start with clear conditions, but they wouldn't last long, as torrential rain and reliability issues would end up taking out more than half of the 45 drivers competing. Klaus piloted the car through the night, building up a substantial lead. However, just a few hours from the end, the injector belt failed with Don behind the wheel, leaving him stranded in the rain as cars flew by, quickly catching up. He grabbed the spare belt and muscled it on without the appropriate tools. But nearly immediately after starting the car, that belt failed too, and he was now stranded without another replacement and it appeared the team was out of luck. The brothers had brought over radios with them, an unusual practice at the time which allowed Don to vent his frustrations with the others from a distance. Then Manfred had the idea to take the alternator belt and use tape to wrap the cam pulley, increasing its circumference to pick up the slack. Don managed to start the car, but didn't dare touch the gas, as the car slowly, miraculously, idled all the way back to the pits. There it would undergo proper repairs, taking valuable time which would have allowed Newman's team to pass the duo of brothers in true Hollywood fashion. But then, they too ran into mechanical issues, and would have to settle for second place. In the end, the Whittington brothers had managed to leverage their illegal business to buy their seats, the car, and win the 24 hours of Le Mans outright, even being the prototypes at one of the most prestigious races in the world. However, their luck would soon turn too, like John Paul Sr., who wasn't at Le Mans this year and instead had been convicted a few months prior. Sr. and Jr. had been caught transferring marijuana from boats to trucks in Louisiana. They pleaded guilty and were placed on probation for three years with a $32,500 fine. After this, Junior didn't want to be involved in smuggling anymore, but this slap on the wrist wouldn't stop Senior, who continued bringing in drugs and racking up wins in the 1979 Trans Am series, taking first in six out of eight races. Junior had started competing as well, 
and at his very first IMSA race in 1980, he teamed up with his father in their own Porsche 935 K3. The father-son duo won their very first race together, and on the very same day, Senior would marry Chalice Barnett on the infield at Lime Rock, who had actually left her husband to marry Paul after taking a ride in one of his cars. Once again, everything seemed to be going well, and the new couple headed off to enjoy their honeymoon in France and compete at Le Mans again, a race that would help Senior win the World Challenge for Endurance Drivers a second time. However, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, as Chalice caught Paul cheating on her at the hotel in France just weeks after their marriage. To make things worse, one of Paul's fits of rage also cost Chalice her job as a flight attendant. She sued for alimony, filed for divorce, and left Paul to pursue being an actress, even appearing in films such as The Cannonball Run. But then, Paul persuaded her to visit him in Florida for a second chance, offering a second, much nicer honeymoon. Chalice accepted and left for Florida. However, no one ever saw her again. Paul continued on like nothing ever happened and traveled to Haiti, where it's legal to get a divorce without both partners present. This allowed him to enter his third marriage to Hope Haywood, the sister of famed racing driver Hurley Haywood. He decided to step back from racing and let Junior take the wheel, who turned out to be incredibly talented and even more gifted than his father. However, this was all still being funded by illegal drug money, and Senior was starting to get paranoid. After working with Steven Carlson to bring back a giant haul, federal agents later found the boat and began pressuring Steven to talk. Steven says that he had no intention of ratting out his partners, but Paul wasn't so sure and hopped in a plane to track Steven down. When he found him, he held him at gunpoint, ordering him to get in the trunk of a car. Steven decided to make a run for it, but Paul shot him in the back, then his hip, dropping him to the ground. Senior walked over and shot him a third time before taking off. Miraculously, Steven Carlson survived, but he certainly wasn't going to protect Paul anymore, who was soon arrested. Senior said he wasn't guilty, and posted bond to delay sentencing and continue dabbling in motorsports just a bit more. By this time, Junior was one of the best, beating drivers like Al Unser and Mario Andretti to win the Michigan 500. I sure thank God for being here. I like to say hello to my father. I love you. Senior was ordered to return to court, but he was nowhere to be found instead hiding underground in a giant covert grow up. Eventually, he fled the country, but was later apprehended in Geneva, Switzerland, and after facing charges there, returned to the States where he was sentenced to a total of 25 years. However, this was far from the end of his story. Around this time, another name was making waves in the racing world, Randy Lanier. Randy grew up on a tobacco farm in Virginia, listening to the Indianapolis 500 on the radio, dreaming that one day he would be able to compete in the race as well. In 1967, his family moved to Florida, but with his construction job only paying $1.65 an hour, it seemed unlikely that he'd ever achieve his dream. Instead, he embraced the Florida lifestyle of the 1960s, growing out his hair and smoking marijuana. Because of his looks, other construction workers started asking him if he could supply them, and before long, he was making far more money selling weed than he was laying bricks. He used this money to buy a boat and scale up his operation, and before long, he was able to buy his own race car, a 1957 Porsche 356. He entered his first ever amateur race and won, showing natural talent for the sport. Then, in 1981, he entered his first IMSA race at the Daytona Finale, partnering with Dale Whittington, the youngest of the three Whittington brothers, and the only one who would avoid time behind bars. Together, they finished 30th, with John Paul Jr. winning the race. Lanier would continue to improve and earn seats for various teams. Randy Lanier is at the car's keyboard now, and he's doing a magnificent job. But he wanted more and decided to start his own team, Blue Thunder Racing. Coincidentally, this was around the time that the film Blue Thunder was released, but Randy says it's not at all related, and was instead the name of a race car hauler that helped the team get started. Ironically, the US Customs Service Drug Interception Team also used the name Blue Thunder for their new high-powered boat at the time, designed to catch drug smugglers. For a teammate, Randy joined forces with Bill Whittington himself, who had gained a lot of experience since his win at Le Mans. 
Rather than entering another Porsche 935, they decided to try the March 84G, a mid-engine prototype powered by a Chevy V8. With Bill as his mentor, Randy improved quickly, winning six races, the most improved driver award, and somehow the 1984 IMSA championship, beating out all of the factory efforts in the very first year of the Blue Thunder racing team. This was a staggering accomplishment, and Randy even received an offer from Ford to become a factory driver the following year. However, he declined. To him, this was just another stepping stone, and he shifted his focus to IndyCar racing the following year. After all, he didn't really need Ford's money anyways. He was making so much money that rather than decide if he wanted to race a March chassis or a Lola chassis next, he simply bought two of each, in cash. He made so much money as a result of the sheer scale of the marijuana he was orchestrating to enter the country. Thanks to a hidden compartment in a giant 300-foot ship and a 110-foot tugboat to accompany it, he brought in well over 100,000 pounds in a single trip, valued around $55 million, of which he would get around $15 million himself. He debated stepping back from smuggling, especially as he witnessed Bill and Don finally get caught, with Don receiving 18 months and Bill getting 15 years, along with the brothers forfeiting millions in assets. To protect their beloved Le Mans winning Porsche, the brothers lent it to a museum, hoping they could get it back when they were released. They also sold Road Atlanta to Randy in 1985. While seeing the downfall of the brothers worried Randy, he was addicted to racing and was so close to his goal, the Indianapolis 500. In 1986, he qualified at 209.964 miles per hour and would go on to finish 10th and win Rookie of the Year, living out his childhood dreams. However, like the Whittington brothers, his luck was also running low. A few months later, Randy qualified 5th for the Michigan 500, but had a tire blowout during the race causing him to crash into a wall at around 214 miles per hour, smashing his right femur. He was rushed to surgery, where doctors inserted a metal rod to repair his leg. Bill Whittington had suffered a similar injury a couple years prior and also had a plate inserted, but his injury was a result of an angry John Paul Sr. purposefully driving into him after he thought he was messing with Junior, which resulted in Bill breaking his arm in 8 places. While Randy's leg would heal in time, it would be much, much longer before he would race again. Randy knew the government agents were closing in on him and he started to make his exit, thinking maybe he'd leap to New Zealand or somewhere else he could still race. He stopped for a bit of a fishing trip near Antigua, where FBI agents showed up far sooner than he had expected. He tried to escape, first on a dinghy, then on foot, but with the help of local police, he was eventually caught. Unlike the other people in the story, Randy was sentenced to life in jail, with no chance of parole, the result of Reagan's war on drugs campaign. At this point, nearly all of the people in this story had been arrested or murdered, with John Paul Jr. also being sentenced to five years after refusing to testify against his father. With so many arrests, IMSA, the International Motorsports Association, was instead being called the International Marijuana Smugglers Association. John Paul Jr. was released after 18 months, and continued to race for a variety of teams without any more issues, but his father still hadn't changed. In prison, he had tried to escape using a concoction of pine sol and hot sauce to blind a guard before trying to flee to an escape vehicle waiting outside. The plot failed and Senior was sent to a maximum security prison. But in 1999, he was finally released, although it wasn't long before he returned to his ways. John Paul Senior posted a personal ad looking for a sailing companion and found Colleen Wood. Colleen fell in love with Paul's stories of racing, Harvard, and making millions, but apparently had no idea of his dark past. Rather, she trusted him enough to sell her condo in Ohio, gave him the $43,000 to invest, and joined him on his 55-foot schooner, named Island Girl at the time. Unfortunately, yet again, Colleen Wood also disappeared. Suspicion immediately turned to Senior, but he denied any involvement, saying she left on her own accord. Her son pleaded with police to investigate, and found that there were over 80 withdrawals from ATMs using her cards. Surveillance showed it wasn't Colleen and it wasn't Senior, but instead it was two women, who said that a man matching Senior's description had paid them to withdraw the money. He denied any involvement, and then he too disappeared once again. By this point, Bill Whittington was also out of prison, released on parole in 1990. 
The brothers tried to get their Le Mans winning Porsche 935 K3 back from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Foundation, filing a lawsuit that they had merely loaned the car to the museum. But the judges ruled that they had donated the car, and they didn't get it back. The youngest brother, Dale, passed away in 2003, with the cause of death being a drug overdose. Still, Don and Bill weren't struggling for money, thanks in part to WorldJet, a company they had founded in 1977. However, in 2009, a DEA investigation found that the company was involved in smuggling cocaine and seized 645000 from their accounts. Then, in 2018, Bill pleaded guilty to filing false tax returns and failing to pay taxes on an offshore account, resulting in another 18 months in prison. In 2021, Bill took a friend with terminal cancer for a joyride in a plane, but crashed and passed away. John Paul Jr. has also passed, after a long battle with Huntington's disease, which took his life in 2020. His father, John Paul Sr., had been spotted in Fiji by someone who had seen the case on Unsolved Mysteries, but authorities weren't able to apprehend him. He was later spotted in Thailand and a variety of other locations, but is still on the run. The website Chalice Paul is an active hub with great resources still trying to figure out where Paul Sr. is and the truth of what happened to Chalice and the other missing individuals. Randy Lanier had settled into prison life, embracing new hobbies like chess, tai chi, and oil painting. With a life sentence, he also plotted to escape numerous times, as he had nothing to lose, although he never found a way out. But then, in 2014, thanks to the Fair Sentencing Act and a review of his non-violent crime, he was finally released, after 27 years in prison. Randy didn't have any money when he got out, but has been making the most of his newfound lease on life advocating for others incarcerated in marijuana-related offenses, working as a brand ambassador for legal cannabis companies, driving for Uber, writing a book of his stories, teaching meditation and Tai Chi, along with coaching performance driving, and of course, getting behind the wheel himself whenever he can. As you can imagine, this story is just a small part of the wild, fascinating era that was drug smuggling and racing in the 1980s. And there are many other drivers who used drug money to fund their racing, such as Pablo Escobar himself, but that's a story for another day. While many of the individuals in this video experienced high highs, and, well, the other kind of highs too, the fallout deeply affected their lives, and I hope this story doesn't encourage anyone to try smuggling drugs themselves. To be clear, I definitely do not support this, so don't try this at home. That said, it does make for some great stories, and I hope you enjoyed this 3-in-1 video. If you'd like to dive in and learn more, I'll leave some links with further details on the people in the story and the ongoing efforts to figure out the mystery still unsolved. Again, thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel, and I hope you have a great day.